before I start, you might have noticed my fire sneakers. My partner bought these for me at a sneaker drop, and I told him there's no way I can pull this off, not anywhere. So naturally, my 11-year-old daughter made a PowerPoint presentation about why I needed to wear them, not just anywhere, but here. <laughs> so as you can see, with these on, I have 99% chance of slaying. So if I slay this talk today, you can thank her. <laughs> on with the show. <laughs> As a psychologist, the thing that I see over and over again is nobody wants to talk about shame and guilt. They just say, I felt bad. Shame and guilt are two of the most misunderstood and uncomfortable moral human emotions. Shame has gotten more spotlight in recent years with Brene Brown's work, but it's still talked about in the context of how do we get rid of this feeling rather than why do we experience this and what can we learn from it? Without understanding our own neurobiology and the functions of these emotions, it's easy to avoid, dismiss, and bypass these feelings in search of comfort or even numbness. But let's consider what might be possible if we learn to transform shame to guilt and sit with this discomfort long enough to learn and grow. What if this helped us to better develop our conscience become stronger parents, leaders, and educators? What if it allows us to become better allies in challenging systems of oppression for a more just world? Let's start by understanding these primal, moral, human emotions a bit better. We often use the words shame and guilt interchangeably, and most of us think of them as negative emotions. But did you know that they're both adaptive and essential elements to our survival in communities. These are the images associated with shame. It's a painful feeling of worthlessness, not being good enough, and being unlovable. It is an intense, altered state of physical collapse, a barrier experience of imploding inwards, and where you feel shut off from the world around you. Your eyes drop your body slumps. Simply put, shame is the feeling of, I'm bad. Guilt, on the other hand, is associated with these images. It's a feeling of remorse and regret, sparking a desire to make amends and reconnect with your community. Guilt is, I did something bad, not I am bad. Feeling guilt is actually a developmental achievement that is only accomplished when experiences of shame are repaired in childhood and you learn to separate who you are from what you did. In fact, many people never learn to feel guilt and instead stay stuck in shame. So how do we get there? From an evolutionary perspective, shame is a powerful parenting tool. Think back to your childhood. Do you remember that look in your parents' eyes or the way that they said your full name that could slice through all the layers of wonder and stop you dead in your tracks? That stomach drop feeling of, oh, I'm in trouble. That's shame. It's the sudden loss of attunement that signals, oh no, I'm bad. However, if shame can be metabolized through the process of repair, then it evolves into guilt. Can you think of another time in your childhood where you broke a rule and your parents sat you down for a talk? If you were lucky, they took the time and care to emotionally connect with you first and explained why your behavior was unacceptable or dangerous and what you can do instead next time. Through rebuilding attunement connection, and trust. Your feelings of shame dissipated, you learned right from wrong, and you felt motivated to do better next time, all without internalizing toxic shame. Your thoughts of, I'm bad, evolved into, well, I'm gonna be cast out if I keep this up, so I better change. After repair, that feeling of wanting to do better, that's guilt, and there are lots of benefits to feeling guilty. 
It motivates remorse and a change in behavior. Guilt is the driving force for apology, personal responsibility, and moral growth. It gives you a path back to connection and belonging. It also allows you to be self-protective, to learn to separate your feelings and actions from your identity. So let's apply this to an adult example. We all know that while the office coffee is lukewarm, the tea is piping hot. <laughs> it's easy to get caught up in workplace gossip. You feel a sense of power and exclusivity being in the know. But sooner or later, it all comes back around and someone gets hurt. That initial feeling after the realization of harm done, that's shame. As adults, we've learned a lot of ways to defend against that feeling because it's so uncomfortable. Especially if we didn't have the earlier experiences of transforming shame to guilt or repair. We might get the urge to flee, avoid the person we hurt, and uh, change the subject. We might want to fight, double down, gloss over it, accuse them of being too sensitive. We might freeze, deny our involvement, play dumb, or crumble in the face of confrontation. Fight, flight, freeze. Yes, your learned shame defenses can resemble trauma responses if you never learned how to manage and clean up shame. Now, how do we metabolize that shame? An important first step is to openly acknowledge our experience. What if we shared with our gossip buddies how embarrassed we all felt? Shame cannot thrive in the light of connection. As adults, being supported and seen in the company of validating others is essential for metabolizing shame to guilt. That feeling of, oh, you too? And not being alone with our shame is a powerful catalyst. What does it look like to respond from a place of guilt? We can admit that while the gossip was fun, it was hurtful and caused harm to someone. We can be present and receptive for the repair conversation and apologize for our role in it. And in the future, we can move beyond these feelings of guilt and remember the lesson. We might be more cautious about what we repeat and to whom. We might think to ourselves, that was pretty uncool of me and didn't align with my values. I'll do better next time. The examples so far involve situations where we rightfully felt shame and guilt and needed to make amends. But what happens when we're shamed for something that isn't wrong or within our control, like features of our identity, self-expression, or emotions? When shame is not repaired or we're made to feel guilty about something that's fundamental to who we are, we learn to hide these parts of ourselves away. We try to conform ourselves, to change, to meet other people's expectations. Or we reject feelings of shame altogether and pretend that we are shameless. Shamelessness is not the lack of shame. This fragile and grandiose posturing of always needing to be right is just a defense against shame. The opposite side of the same coin that keeps us stuck in denial, isolation, and you guessed it, shame. What about collective shame that we feel on an individual basis because of our membership in a group that has acted irresponsibly and is now facing collective scrutiny? I'm talking about patriarchy, white supremacy, heteronormativity, and any other system of power and oppression that benefits some of us that we didn't opt into. The shame of these experiences are sticky and confusing, but we already have the tools to persevere through them. Let's apply this to the pursuit for racial justice as an example. The shame we feel in these moments is highly dependent on our identity and lived experiences. As people of color, we've been shamed for being too much or not enough of something we have very little control over too white, too ethnic, not white enough. And for white people, it's the collective shame and dissonance of recognizing this country's racist history and the ways that they've benefited from whiteness, also something that they have very little control over. 
Racism and anti-racism are learned behaviors. So let's unpack this using the stages of learning as a framework. According to Dr. Darian Sutton Ramsey's 2020 article and TikTok, there are four stages of learning about racism. The first stage is unconscious incompetence, also known as ignorance. We don't know what we don't know. Just like not realizing how office gossip can be harmful, people at this stage don't see racism as a current problem, nor a need to fix it. Many white people may say that they're colorblind, while people of color tend to pander to whiteness, downplay their ethnic features as a means of survival. The next stage is conscious incompetence, where folks are aware that it's a problem, but don't know what to do about it. This is the shame stage. For white people, it looks like helplessness, complacency, feeling stuck, and white fragility. While people of color experience this as bitterness, resentment, hopelessness, and may adopt a victim mentality. For many Americans, this is where we tap out. The intensity of shame becomes intolerable and we defend against it through fight, flight, freeze, just like when the office tea gets too hot. But if we're able to persevere through this shame, connect with our community, and learn to differentiate racism as an individual problem of who we are to a systemic understanding of what we collectively did, then we may get to the conscious competence stage. This is the most common stage for anti-racism work and the one associated with guilt. Just like when we start apologizing for spreading gossip, we become aware of our biases and are actively learning and unlearning. This is a tricky phase though, because the weight of learning often falls on people of color. White people in this stage are engaged and motivated, yet they may act from a sense of urgency, which can result in ungrounded action, such as leading charges that aren't theirs to lead. Acting from urgency is a tactic used to deflect against the discomfort of shame and previous inaction, rather than acting from aligned values. This inside-out, bottom-up work takes time and intention, and it simply cannot be done with urgency. On the other hand, people of color at this stage may burn themselves out. They may work tirelessly and be tokenized to teach, and they may feel the relentless sense of urgency to meet the demands placed on them. So, what comes next? The final stage of learning is unconscious competence, where practicing anti-racism becomes second nature. Very few people reach this stage, but those who do are rooted in a desire for collective liberation. In the office example, this is not where we learn to not only watch our own mouths, but also actively foster a workplace culture of inclusivity. Folks here are actively healing their individual historic and generational traumas, and act from a place of self-awareness, healthy shame, and productive guilt. Using principles of collective care, mutual aid, and community organizing, this work is extended beyond racial injustice to dismantle all systems of oppression with ourselves and with our earth. Folks at this stage understand that anti-oppressive praxis requires ongoing and continuous action reflection, and rest. And most importantly, they tap and feed into the power of community and reciprocity with a deep understanding that none of this can be done alone. Now take a moment to reflect. Where are you in these stages of learning? Where would you like to be? And who are the people in your life who can help you get there? The antidote to shame is connection, disclosure, and empathy. It's a social emotion, so we simply cannot heal it alone. The good news is, the more of our own shame that we learn to clean up, the better we're able to sit with others through theirs. We may still fall into our own shame pits sometimes, but they get shallower and we're able to move to guilt and lessons learned more quickly and nimbly. Whether you spill the hot tea at work, 
made a microaggression out of ignorance, or broke your mom's favorite vase and blamed it on the dog. Know that the path back involves connection and persevering through discomfort. Because when we surround ourselves with a safe, engaged, and values-aligned community, the pursuit of racial justice and collective liberation becomes a real possibility. Thank you. Woo!